Wonderful to have you back, uh, Tarun, after the two years of uh, COVID. Otherwise, as I just said, this would have been the 18th edition of uh, JLF. We owe several thanks to Tarun because he took JLF as a case study into the Harvard Business School. And, it's a uh, very popular case study. <clears throat> yeah. So, Tarun, jumping straight into the book, why meritocracy? Why is it so important? First of all, thank you. Thank you, more than thank you to uh, the festival organizers. It's always fun to be here. It's lovely to see the enthusiasm, particularly of the young people. And as I get older, the younger the better, <laughs> so to, to speak. Um, why meritocracy? Um, you know, it, uh, it's, it's a topic that uh, I'm, an, I'm an applied math e economics person. Um, uh, fortunately for me, born to some privilege and privilege to be in good schools. But I've always been conscious that, um, that there's a lot of talent around us that is left by the wayside, so to speak. And it's, a, uh, frankly, a moral issue and a colossal economic loss. And both those aspects uh, interest me a great deal. Um, so much so that just not just as an academic, but as an entrepreneur, building companies that do something about talent inclusion has always been a passion of mine. Uh, so some years ago, uh, at a fortuitous meeting with a colleague who is a historian of China at Harvard, uh, uh, Mark Elliott. Um, uh, we were sitting with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Yi Wang, a colleague from China, uh, and discussing this idea of competitive examinations. And of course, uh, in India, we are very familiar with the idea of competitive examinations. The Chinese Gao Kao is very, very celebrated. Uh, and in, in that conversation, what crystallized was this, uh, not really an epiphany that would be overstating it, but this idea that, look, wouldn't it be nice to uh, and, and Harvard itself, by the way, there is a U.S. Supreme Court case that's being heard as we sit here uh, against Harvard U University, uh, criticizing Harvard for being unfair in, uh, in perhaps, uh, to caricature a bit, and in, 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 in language that would be familiar to us in India, perhaps overdoing affirmative action, so to speak. Um, uh, and we'll see what happens uh, uh, with that case. Uh, but this idea of allowing people to advance in whatever endeavor they're engaged in, whether it's in the corporate world, in universities, uh, as aspirants to jobs of different sorts, on the basis of their merit, both uh, acquired and endowed talent as well as nurtured merit, um, or, or alternatively allocating seats to them in ways that some people would, be, would see as fair and moral and others would see as manifestly unfair, seems to be a universal debating item across society. So that was the gestation of the project. What's interesting is, of course, the term meritocracy is a term that arose in the mid-1950s in Britain. But the idea of meritocracy is as old as the hills in some ways. Um, you know, whether you go back to the Qing dynasty or even further back to Confucius or Mencius in China, uh, you go back to Kautilya's Arthashastra, uh, you go back to the Mughal era, you see, as, it wasn't of course called meritocracy, but the idea is very robust. So we became very interested both as a practical, conceptual, historical, philosophical, moral matter, um, and perhaps the most practical issue of our times. Um, to what extent can meritocracy really be seen as an organizing principle for societies? So that's the genesis of the project. Uh, the book that we produced, Making Meritocracy, which is sort of the basis for this conversation, the trigger for this conversation, uh, is an edited collection of essays uh, with a different uh, um, uh, professor of Chinese history uh, from, uh, from Harvard, Michael Sonyi, um, uh, and represents the culmination of maybe seven or eight years of effort by, I want to say, 50 or 60 scholars from uh, Beijing, Shanghai, um, Guangzhou, uh, Singapore, the UK, the US, etc. So that's kind of where we are. But really the idea is to think about how do we organize societies and is it sensible to use meritocracy as an organizing principle uh, and what are the pros and cons and what are the limits of meritocracy? So let's begin with um, the first society which actually implemented or tried to implement meritocratic principles in running society, uh, the civil services, which goes back over one millennium in China. To what extent did that work? And what was the manifestation of that in the actual running of that society? What kind of ideals was it able to manifest in China? So what's really interesting, uh, what's really interesting about, so the modern, modern version of that 
uh, is the Chinese Gaokao, so to speak. Uh, Gaokao is the, is the Putunghua term uh, for the examination system, and it's a source of uh, immense stress in China. Um, you know, you sh just like, I guess, some of the competitive exams here, perhaps more so. IIT versus Gaokao? Uh, since I haven't done the Gaokao, I did do the IIT exam, um, and it was great training uh, for me, uh, and I'm glad it's behind me. Uh, uh, I think the Gaokao is probably more stressful in some ways, in terms of societal pressure, and uh, it's a little bit above my pay grade as to determine why that's more stressful. But in any case, it's a stressful examination, and, um, but the idea very much is it's a way of being fair in society. That's, that's, we can explore the limits of that idea because there are very many severe limits as our book kind of goes through and articulates. Um, but the idea very much is that by allowing people to be on a level playing field where you study as much as you want and however, wish, however you wish, uh, and you come to this exam and it takes uh, you know, some lengthy period of time. By the way, as we speak, my daughter is, uh, my 22-year-old daughter is sitting for uh, the American uh, medical school exam, which is another eight-hour draconian 1% or 2% pass examination. So we're in the midst of this uh, uh, household tension again <laughs> in, a different, in a different setting. But you sit for this exam uh, and everybody sits on an even playing field, so to speak. And that's always been the philosophy of it, that you, you come to it as best as you can and based on the outcome, you are allotted some favored outcome. Uh, or your allotted outcome on a spectrum, and so on. Uh, and that's how the Gaokao has always run. Now, interestingly, what constitutes merit, uh, what, 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 you know, what, what is seen as meritorious, uh, varies across time and space. And that's true even in the, in the Chinese civil service. My favorite example of that, which I wasn't aware of, was that for a long period of time, uh, the ability to compose a poem uh, was, was the defining characteristic of being meritorious. Not in the Gaokao, in the Chinese civil service. In the service, Chinese civil that? service, yeah. Yeah. Not, in the, not in the Gaokao. <laughs> uh, the Gaokao Which was very actually much. the topic of a book by Vikram, by a poem by Vikram Seth and the title. That's right, yeah. that's, mm -hmm. that's absolutely right, that's mm -hmm. absolutely right. Um, and you know, the, it's very, very interesting, but the idea there very much is that that's something that you can't fake. You either have some intrinsic, uh, these days with chat GPT, I'm not so sure, <laughs> maybe you can fake the writing, uh, the writing of a poem, but the idea was that that is the ability to compose an elegant poem uh, is a signal of virtue and talent and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, even these days we are preoccupied with the same concerns. We're preoccupied with how do you do something creative? How do you know that it's genuinely creative? Uh, that it's not ripping somebody else's uh, IP intellectual property off and so on. Uh, so the measures of merit varied, but the notion was always that you come together to do something uh, that is seen as being fair and recalibrates uh, society so that uh, the most advantageous don't continue to perpetuate their advantage uh, from generation to generation. Uh, that, that's always been the notion. So this brings two questions to mind, uh, Tarun. One is the assumption that when you go up for the Gaokao or any other competitive examination, that um, it is a level playing field devoid of any context before that. The family that you came from, um, the genetics of that, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the fact which I think is hardwired into all of us as humans, which is to give our kids the best leg up. So that's one set of questions which is tackled by the book and I'd like you to dwell upon. And the other which you raised, which is what are you measuring and how relevant is it to what that measurement tool is supposed to engender? One example of that, the Indian Administrative Services, or the UPSC in general. You take an exam, you get a grade, and that grade pretty much determines what you do for the next 40 years, irrespective of what qualities are demanded of an administrator. Just the fact that you got that exam, unless you do something severely wrong, almost dictates your progress over the next 30 years. So these are sort of two sets of questions which I'd like you to examine. You know, having just spent seven years mulling over these questions with 50 people smarter than myself, um, I, I can talk ad nauseum on this. So let me pick up a couple of strands, uh, just in the interest I'll of... I'll tell you when I'm ready to puke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, pick up a couple of strands. You know, one of, the, one of the things that I think Michael and I, my co-editor and I, and our colleagues um, came away with was this notion that um, uh, it's, as Yogi Berra says in, uh, in, in, in America, it's deja vu all over again. 
uh, that there really is no exceptionalism in any society. Even though we may think that we are going through in India a particular set of uh, tensions and discussions and adjudications of fairness or lack thereof, uh, the Chinese are thinking about the same issues. Uh, the Americans are thinking about the same issues and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think there's a universality to, uh, to, to this. And that's why we titled the book uh, the making of meritocracy, because what we sort of concluded uh, as one abstract conceptual conclusion uh, of our investigations of societies across time and space uh, was, was, was the following, that meritocracy contains the seeds of its own demise. Uh, I think that's probably a succinct way to say it. And the best way to understand that is to go back to the way you started the question just now, Mohit. Uh, imagine, um, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a tabula rasa, we approach a situation from a clean sheet of paper, and we're all equal uh, by, by construction, uh, and we are assigned a competition of some sort, so it's manifestly fair by construction. Some will do better, some will do worse. Those who are better will immediately rig the system for their own progeny. I would, you would, everybody in this room would. We are hardwired that way, uh, and therefore, by definition, the next round of the competition will not be, uh, will not be fair, uh, no matter what you do about it. Now, of course, societies have recognized this for, for, for centuries, and so every society recognizing this engages in what we refer to in the book as a form of compensatory discrimination, right? which is we are going to accept that as a society, we will discriminate today, whether for issues uh, of moral compunction to redress what we think was unfairness in the past uh, or for issues of efficiency for the future and we will accept a diminution in efficiency today in return for an enhancement of efficiency tomorrow. And allegedly the, 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 the enhancement of efficiency tomorrow will come because we are being more inclusive of talent today. And had we not in the, in, in, you know, uh, participated in this or, or allowed society to subscribe to this compensatory discrimination, we would not be able to tap into talent that's being left out today, and we'd be much worse off tomorrow. That really is a conceptual summary of an iterative cycle that's played out every 10, 15, 20 years, perhaps every generation in society after society after society. Now, what constitutes merit varies by time and, and place, as I suggested, you know. Uh, maybe in the Mughal time, it was Gursavari, uh, or swordsmanship or something like that. In some parts of China, it was calligraphy. Uh, these days, it might be, uh, you know, uh, uh, developing a machine learning, uh, uh, writing the code for machine learning in some ways or deciphering the output of uh, something else uh, or sequencing a genome in a better and better way. What constitutes merit, uh, the metrics of merit will change, but the abstract process uh, is always going to be the same. And the result of this is that Meritocracy, as I said before, contains the seeds of its own demise. No matter what we do, those who are ahead in this round of the competition will rig the game uh, for their progeny. We will then try to curtail the effects of that rigging and the system will repeat itself. That is why the book is called The Making of Meritocracy because I think axiomatically from our argument, uh, you will not be able to have perfect meritocracy ever. Fair enough. And in a sense, what you have done is to insert Singapore into that book as an example of a meritocracy which by and large worked. But I won't go there right now. I want to go to India, where uh, it's not one generation. It's hundreds of generations of inequality. And though we have had affirmative action, and there have been questions about whether it works or not, firstly, we've only had it in... Um, in certain spheres of uh, Indian um, uh, enterprise and more importantly affirmative action too requires certain basic qualifications. Um, how do you deal with the fact that the likelihood that a poor Dalit family has a single child who has completed 12 years of school is something like 9 or 10 percent today. So cannot even be the subject of affirmative action. So it, this is a, you know, in a sense, this is a question that occurs um, 
I'll answer it by not answering it in okay. some sense. Um, this is a question that, again, is not unique uh, to, uh, to, to, to India. Um, now, when I, when I talk about this book in America, the way we, the way we speak about it is that um, there is no American exceptionalism. That in the design of affirmative action policies uh, in America, which we call reservations here, um, we should be looking at the experiences of other countries, including India and China. And I would say the same thing in India, which is we should be looking at the experience of other places. Uh, and what I would note is that, uh, you know, in, in, in the U.S. you have populations that for much less time than in America, because, than, than in India, because America is a, is a much younger, younger country. Uh, but you have systemic discrimination that's been visited on some subpopulations for reasons of race or um, uh, primarily race, uh, but also other contours. And it is extremely difficult to overcome that with uh, even what I was referring to as compensatory discrimination. Uh, it's certainly not in one generation, and it appears not in two or three generations. Uh, that's an empirical statement that I'm making as opposed to, of course, you see isolated successes, uh, but as a general rule, it appears to take a lot longer process to, to do this. Um, you know, my, uh, my colleague, the uh, eminent political philosopher Michael Sandel at Harvard has a lovely book out um, with which I disagree, uh, but it's a lovely book, The Tyranny of Merit, um, where he basically says, uh, look, we tried this, uh, you know, racket. He doesn't use the word racket, but I'm using it uh, for colloquial, colloquial purposes. We tried this racket many times. It doesn't work. We tried compensatory discrimination. Uh, in a, he's talking about America primarily. Uh, we tried to give people who were left behind uh, maybe a legacy of slavery for some populations, uh, other issues for, say, Native Americans, etc. And we tried to give them a leg up, and it's not working. And, uh, uh, and in any case, I, as a moral philosopher, if I try to imagine a society where you have to work this hard to do this, and even if you succeed, you're unhappy, uh, and if you don't succeed, then you're left out and deemed you know, unmeritorious and perhaps unworthy in some ways. It doesn't even seem like a just society. So I don't like that idea, and I suggest that we uh, not pursue it. Uh, so my co-editor, Michael Sonny, and I have a different point of view because half of me is an entrepreneur and a pragmatist. And my response is, well, give me a better idea. Uh, there has to be some organizing principle. We tried the idea that we don't use merit at all, um, uh, uh, and we allocate tasks based on something that's orthogonal to merit, uh, and it's failed uh, wherever we've tried it. Um, and societies over centuries have embraced this idea of compensatory discrimination, and despite the fact that it's not perfect, have, I think, realized time and time again that we are best served by continuing, sort of like Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill, only to find that it's rolling back. Uh, but I think the best thing that we can do is to make the pushing of the boulder up the hill smoother and smoother, and less and less uh, effortful, uh, or more and more effortless in some ways, uh, and make the, uh, make the making of meritocracy uh, more and more desirable, because we don't have an alternative. Uh, so that's kind of where I come out. It's a uh, bit like democracy. It's a bad system except for all exactly, the others. Exactly. Yeah. So in fact, we, we use that line in the book as well, so that, that, you know, it's, to paraphrase Churchill, uh, right, right. This, is, this is not so great, but it's better than everything else. Uh, right. So, you know, when we talk about meritocracy, the interesting thing about uh, China that I found, correct me if I'm wrong, from studying the book, is that um, they're promoting meritocracy in in the services and in the entrance to exams. Um, whereas the political system is now becoming quite opaque. And uh, we now have, again, for the first time in several decades, a supreme leader saying that he is not subject to term limits. What do you think this is going to do to the acceptance of meritocracy in such a large system? So, uh, you know, the Xi Jinping story is just starting to play out. Um, and far be it for me to prognosticate about what's going to happen to the party. Uh, I'm in the fortunate situation of having so many amazing uh, Chinese students spread all over China. So. I do have um, 
uh, feet on the street, <laughs> so to speak, re realism, and enough realism to realize that nobody really knows what's, how this is going to unfold. But I would say that one of the defining characteristics of um, um, the Chinese system, the way I see it, is that uh, there has always been, uh, theoretically, and I think to a much greater extent than India, empirically, what I would describe as free entry into the rough and tumble of political competition. And I think that's a very important aspect of acceptance, because you asked about acceptance. So I think as long as the entry into, let's pause it for a second that, um, uh, that there is uh, less contestation at the top, uh, and therefore less checks and balances on you know, the supreme leader, so to speak, which appears to be the case now and compared. Uh, I think that you will see, it'll be quite some time before you see resistance to the Gaokao because entry into the Gaokao is still encouraged. Um, you still have um, people, including my students, who are, uh, arrive at a point in their careers. Uh, my students, of course, are people I taught at Harvard who then go back to China and want to engage in professions or the academy, etc. And invariably, at some point, uh, they are confronted with the decision of should we try to join the party or not. Um, uh, in my small sample empiricism, I would say that most who are uh, concerned with self-advancement, which is an entirely natural uh, 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 inclination, I would say, for most, most people, uh, do try to join the party. Now, the empirical data are, I may be off by a, by a few years, empirical data are there are 1.3, 1.4 billion people in China. There may be uh, 80, 90 people, uh, 80, 90 million people uh, in, in, in the party. So 7%, 6% in the party. So getting into the party apparatus is itself a competitive process and you're, not that the Gaokao admits you to the party, the Gaokao admits you to a university and then that opens the door to other advancement and then you are seen as meritorious in some ways uh, and then you join the party, so to speak. Um, so as long as that entry process is seen as fair and relatively level, uh, I don't think what's happening at the top is going to really impinge on that. That's my hunch for quite some time. Uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the quotes I remember from the book was that um, if you didn't have the Kao yeah. and this appearance of uh, a meritocracy or a fair system, there would be an incredible amount of uh, social tension right. in China. And I thought that was very telling. And um, it also contrasted it with the perception that everything else is run by another Chinese word, which is Guangxi, which is connection. So it contrasts Gao Kao as a fair system with Guangxi, which is unfair. So along these sort but, of... But if, if I may, uh, I don't know that Guangxi is uh, manifestly unfair. Um, and what you will see, I think, in... Uh, so Guangxi, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, is just this idea that it's not different from how we live our lives, right? It's, it's about relationships, the idea uh, the idea, allegedly, is that in China, more things get done on the basis of who you know, uh, as opposed to um, at arm's length basis, the way it might be in, particularly in Western societies. Uh, and I think there is some truism to that, uh, but perhaps overstated. That's just my personal view. Uh, but even Guangxi, uh, there is, you know, what, uh, what in... Uh, so if you think about, there's an, uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm a mathematician, I think abstractly, but if you think about a population of people, uh, you know, there has to be a matching process, whereas I decide, is Mohit Satyanand going to be my friend? Uh, and Mohit decides, you know, is this guy going to be my friend? And typically what you find in most walks of life is that there is a process of what's referred to as assertative matching, which is, uh, you know, basically more competent people affiliate with more competent people. Um, and uh, so Guan Chi, the, the, what we see as Guanxi today, of course, is influenced by tribal realities and historical endowment but I think is also mediated by, uh, by, 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 uh, by one's, uh, by the perception one has of the other person's merit. Um, so once you and merit are not orthogonal to each other, uh, that generally your level of merit will probably, I would guess, influence who you associate with and with whom you develop Guan Xi in some ways, and that in turn. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. That's, that's interesting because the way I sort of assumed it functioned was a bit like it functioned in India until about 20 or 30 years ago, where yeah. a lot of it was caste-related and the same yeah. town and the same clan. Yeah. And uh, so you've been involved... And I, I think that, that, that 
so, so, so to be clear, Mohit, I'm not saying that that's not so in China. I just think that it's a lot less than it is uh, in India. That's my perception, having traipsed around in both these societies for, well, in India since I was born, but in China for the last 25 years or so. Yeah. Right. So I'd just like you to dwell for a little bit on having traipsed around uh, India for 25 years and lived in India before that. Do you see a change in this, um, this very relationship, kinship-oriented connection in India to the India that you see today? Yes, um, I do. Um, I, and I don't know that it's a result of our you know, competitive systems or so on and so forth, because those, if anything, have been... Um, so going back to this idea of compensatory discrimination, uh, I think that what happens in any process of compensatory discrimination is almost by definition, those who are being discriminated against, who tend to be the better off, uh, hate it and think it's unfair uh, and protest against it and think it's overdone. That's the definition of the, uh, of the idea. Uh, and those who are being helped uh, think that it's not being done enough. And you see that today with disadvantaged populations, um, you know, uh, um, uh, people who have to compete for, you know, jobs in the public sector enterprises or seats in the IIT uh, will say, why are we reserving so many seats? And those for whom the seats are being reserved are, will, will say, by and large, that probably not enough is being done uh, despite the reservation of the seats, uh, and so on. Um, so I don't think that, and, and since the percentage of reservation seems to have been going up over time, I don't think that's the reason why, um, uh, uh, that that's been as instrumental as what I would guess it's more just the evolution of technology and the computing revolution and those sorts of things that are triggering you know, the spread of uh, English to some extent, um, the recognition in smaller towns and villages that there is a way through education to circumvent barriers and so on. Uh, not that caste and location don't matter, they manifestly do, and disappointingly continue to stymie the uh, aspirations of uh, many, many hundreds of thousands of uh, youth in this country. Uh, but I think at least technology offers a road out for some subset of them. So I do think it's improved, but it's for those reasons. It's not so much for what we've been trying to do with meritocracy. Is my is my hunch um, right? I think we can do a lot better. Going back to your comment about, uh, I forget the statistic. Maybe you said ten percent of Dalits are equipped to 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 compete uh, or to even benefit from affirmative action. I think the best thing that we could be doing for meritocracy in this country is just strengthening basic education. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. you know, absolutely basic primary education, which the Chinese dealt with a long time ago in a much better fashion. And we know from the great work that's being done in this country wow. by you know, by school teachers and by the likes of Pratham and others, uh, that we've got a long way to go. Right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And the latest uh, report from ASSER shows yeah. how much we've regressed no, as a result right. of yeah. Uh, yeah. COVID yeah. and our inability to devise a system to deal with it. But you mentioned IIT, and there was a very provocative article there, which is also very timely, yeah. uh, which is about how if I'm in IIT, I think I'm meritorious. Um, <laughs> But actually, when you look at the um, cohorts coming out from IIT, there's a very strong caste bias. Yes. Would you like to comment on that? So this is a, a colleague um, 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 uh, who has contributed a chapter. Uh, I should say that the chapters are contributed by a very wide range of disciplinary backgrounds. And I think uh, one of the, if I may say so, one of the nice things about the book is its incredible eclecticism, because a topic like meritocracy is so wide-ranging, and the idea of fairness and unfairness uh, can be examined from uh, historical processes, from political science, from economic implications, uh, from the law, a matter of law or not, from ethics. Uh, we even have applied mathematicians and engineers uh, working on the issue of meritocracy. Uh, there's a lovely chapter on measures, which I hope we come to uh, momentarily. But going back, going back to the, going back to the uh, chapter on IITs, there's a, lot, there's a chapter on IITs where the author, uh, anthropologist uh, Ajanta Subramaniam, uh, basically says that those who do well in the IIT shouldn't uh, confuse uh, their success as being, I think she would say, purely as a function of merit, that it's also a result of um, accumulated benefit because most of them appear to come from relatively privileged backgrounds. Uh, and, and Michael Sandel makes the same point about, um, about uh, say, Harvard, 
uh, without picking on Harvard necessarily, but Harvard is an, uh, as an emblem of privilege in America, saying that those uh, of us who are privileged enough to go to a school like that shouldn't be confused that it is only our merit that got us there because we are standing on the shoulders of many generations of proverbial giants. And I think that's very right. Uh, I'm acutely conscious of my privilege, for instance. Absolutely. And, and, and that's but, fair. But this uh, IIT issue yeah. has current political relevance even in the US in terms of the fact that some people in, on the West Coast have alleged that Indians from IIT have carried the caste system over into large US organizations. Uh, it sounds both believable and yet fabulous. Where do you stand? I have no idea. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. I've read the same stories you have. Um, uh, is it plausible? It's plausible. I mean, I could imagine um, uh, people uh, who are, I don't know, I think, I think there are the news reports that I read we probably can sh shouldn't go too deep into it because neither you nor I know too much about Fair it. Enough. Fair enough. Uh, uh, but it's plausible that somebody would say, look, I don't want to associate with so-and-so because you know, his or her grandfather or somebody said this. I, I just don't know. Yeah. In a sense, affirmative action creates a new caste system because in the IIT, you talk about merit students and reserve students. So it creates its own ethical issues. Yeah. This is a hugely important point. So those who, uh, there's a subset of those who uh, complain about compensatory discrimination not because, um, uh, not because they perceive it as unfair to themselves, the privileged, uh, but they think that it's a, a wrong societal design choice, if you will, because it makes people um, uh, feel uh, dependent on others. Uh, so it makes people feel like I'm a fraud. Uh, it's an imposter syndrome in some sense, and it's, it's almost like an institutionalized imposter syndrome. And so their argument is, look, uh, shouldn't we be doing something more basic uh, to help disadvantaged sections of society, uh, such as go back to primary education and strengthen it and so forth. And I have no quarrel with that. Of course, as I just said a few moments ago, that is absolutely a central tenet of making society more fair, is to strengthen those sorts of things, and to do things like strengthen public health and so on and so forth, uh, basic public goods in the economy. Uh, but the argument against that, of course, is that, well, that's not fast enough. Because if we do that, you know, the current, the next one or two generations are still going to suffer for a long time. So we ought to do that and do the discrimination and try to minimize this feeling of uh, isolation and imposter syndrome and so on and so forth. Uh, but that is, again, going back to the idea that there is no societal exceptionalism, that these are patterns that you see. And you see that with rural Chinese who get uh, compensatory points in the Gaokao uh, to say that you're not part of a great uh, primary and secondary education system and a coaching system, if you will, for the Gaokao, uh, and you're competing with kids from uh, Beijing and Shanghai and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chengdu and other places where there are good schools, so we should give you some extra points. But those kids also feel like, are we frauds in uh, Tsinghua or Beida or someplace like that? So. Well, we don't even have that. So, you know, the, your preface your, to the book says that in China the division is along rural versus urban and in India it's caste. I think in India it's both. It's rural versus urban plus caste. So the divides are huge. And as you said, the only cure really is primary education. I would add one more, which is demand. Demand for educated people, and that's growth. And we suffer on that score as well. And I think China had that wind in its sails. Yeah, but the, the, you know, we shouldn't think of growth as, uh, I would say, exogenous. as social science, okay. exogenous. The growth is a result of... Uh, taken. Uh, if I, there's a lovely book written by uh, 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 a political economist at Berkeley many years ago. Uh, I had written a book, Billions of Entrepreneurs, 20 years ago, well, a little less. And uh, Pranab Bardhan, who was a political economist at Berkeley, wrote a lovely book after that, uh, where I think, and I may be misquoting pra Pranab Dao for a second, but he basically said the single biggest reason that China did well is primary education. I think there's a lot of truth to that, actually. Yeah. I, I, I would be or very happy like to agree. Or something like China is capitalist today because it was socialist yesterday in its allocation of primary education and resources. We're seeing, that, we're seeing the same thing in Vietnam. Absolutely. It's way Absolutely. above us in all Absolutely. educational, yeah. and we're seeing that in Vietnam exports today. Yeah. It's, uh, but both, Mohit, both in, um, I'm currently a co-chair of the Lancet Commission for Public Health. The Lancet is uh, perhaps the world's leading global health journal, uh, reimagining India's uh, healthcare system. 
which is the same issue. We're not investing in public health either. In fact, in expenditure in, in public health is best case stagnant as a ratio to GDP, uh, which is, you know, if I can use a technical term, nuts. I agree. You know, Tarun, we could talk for hours, um, but I think it's only fair to, uh, to use the last six minutes that we have to take questions. Um, I'm a little handicapped by the fact that I have these lights glaring in my eyes, so I may not be able to see people as well. But the first hand I saw was way back there um, next to the edge. Yeah, I can see a white sleeve. So if you can get a mic to him. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Tarun, excellent, uh, excellent, excellent talk. So the question that I have is a paradox. If you see, for example, the last uh, 10 prime ministers of India, the last 10 presidents of the United States, or indeed the last 10 prime ministers of Pakistan and Bangladesh, there's a very interesting difference. India may be an unequal society, but we've had prime ministers like Shastri, Vajpayee, Charan Singh, and now Modi, who are working class, or lower middle class. I do not see that in any of the three other countries, including the United States. Especially in Britain, you have to be a graduate not even of Cambridge or London. It seems Oxford, whether you're Labour or uh, Conservative, doesn't matter. And in America, it's de rigueur to be Ivy League, right? Think of an Ivy League president out of the last 10. Joe Biden. Yeah, Joe Biden is one exception. But any ob observations on this? No, I think it's a, it's a fair point, and I think that's a, uh, I would celebrate the part of the Indian system that <laughs> results in grassroots rough and tumble politics, uh, you know, including Mr. Modi and uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri and others. Of course, we've had elites as well, you know, we had Nehru and we've had others and so on. Uh, but I think, you know, the point that you're making is, uh, is, is, is wonderful, so that, uh, if anything, I would say that we should celebrate the aspect of uh, contestation in the political realm that has resulted in, you know, whether it's the uh, unions in the, in the whatever, in the colleges that have resulted in people rising through the ranks and making their way uh, through party systems and so on, uh, and think about how we can keep that competition going and not result in, uh, you know, domination of one side or the other. So, but it's a great observation. Thank you for that. I had not thought about it. Yeah. Question in the second row with the beard, uh, By the way, it is, it is a huge source of tension in America, right? I mean, the, the, the Ivy League is, is rightly, uh, as a product and a continuing member of the Ivy League, so to speak, of Princeton and Harvard, I'm acutely conscious of this. And next generation Princeton as well. Yes, as he's pointing out, it's intergenerational transmission of advantage. Yeah, please, your question. Uh, so we are seeing, uh, uh, we're seeing systemic uh, fissures in the uh, in the current psych in the current paradigm in terms of the technological disruption of education and this is happening huge in India we're having people offering MIT sl MIT Sloan of man management uh, degrees online so we're seeing a completely a complete changeover on what it is to get an education uh, to put it in Foucault's euphemistic what's your question please yes uh, uh, to put it in uh, Foucault's uh, euphemistic power structures uh, narrative how are how is this going to change the uh, future paradigm um, so, you know, I, I've uh, just in, in, in line with your uh, observation, I've always found it crazy that lifespans in the developed world at least are in excess of 80 years, even, even that high 80s. And we take kids and young people and generally even the most educated get to 22 and then that's the end of education. That just seems bizarre to me. At some point we're going to come back and do this. And I think it's fabulous that we're seeing so much experimentation. Um, I, you know, I recorded a, one of these MOOCs, Massive Open Online yeah. Courses, that's one of Harvard's more popular ones, called Entrepreneurship in Emerging Economies. It's been taken by over a million students in 200 countries, and it, as an academic, I'm so happy to see that, you know, ideas are being used in different ways. Nothing makes me happier than seeing the productive. So the more power to the competition, and, you know, we should compete with the IITs, compete with the Ivy League, and give them a run for their money. Fabulous. Yeah, but... You know, this is only a different medium. If you wanted to grow, you always had to continue to learn in whatever way you took that learning. You mean after 22? Yeah, and so yeah, and so yeah. Yeah, and you know, what's nice is that now if you are, you know, if you have somehow uh, uh, acquired the love of learning through hook or by crook, uh, you know, you're like a kid in a candy store now. Absolutely. Because there's so much you that you pass can... pass the mic to the person two rows behind you with a... 
with the hand up. No, no, here in front. The hand up here. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Please stand up so we can see you. Uh, my question is in relation to something you've mentioned on the evolution of what merit means. In the sense that regardless of time and space where you've seen it might be a poem or today is a TikTok, really doesn't matter. But do you see merit going from an obsession of output, regardless of the type of output, to something related with human well-being? So like changing the definition from being obsessed with whatever it is that we create to whatever it is that we are. In the sense that if you look at whoever is doing whatever evil you see on the news, everyone is very meritocratic. Everyone has climbed the ladder and everyone has the best education in the world. Still climate change is happening, still wars are happening. So do you think that definition of merit will go from output to human well-being? And how, what's your vision on that? Uh, no. No. Uh, because I think human well-being is the output. Uh, merit is the input to it, right, in some sense. So we can think about what is the better desired output, which might be reduction of the uh, inability to price, uh, you know, carbon output or something that results in more pollution and warming and environmental destruction and biodiversity loss or whatever. You can articulate the output. You still want the most meritorious people in the right positions to be able to now train their energies and talents towards achieving the newly articulated measure of human well-being. So I don't think we should confuse inputs and outputs. I take your point, but I wouldn't confuse the inputs and outputs. That's my short response. Yeah. Um, I'm sure the venue managers out there are gesturing, but I can't see because uh, um, there's strong light from there. So we'll take this question here. Thank you. My name is Varun Kurana. I completely agree that primary education needs a big heads up in India. But the other side is where I see billions of dollars of capital transfer from India. Uh, whoever I see does well, doesn't get into IITs, goes abroad and spends billions of dollars and they end up working abroad. So isn't India lo a loser in that regard? This is a wholly separate question and I think it's a very good question. But it has relatively little to do <laughs> with, with the issue of meritocracy, except indirectly. Uh, I think in a sense, you know, one way I would reframe the comment uh, is to say uh, that we can give our best institutions in this country, you know, uh, so I was, um, I matriculated IIT Madras and I would have been very happy and got an excellent education at IIT Madras. And then I had an offer to study mathematics at Princeton. So in essence, we ran a competition for at least this one person. Should I, should I study at Princeton? And I chose Princeton. So in a sense, I competed, you know, Princeton competed with IIT for, allow me to say, good talent or reasonably good talent. And I think that process of competition is what we need to have to let, to let it continue to be unfettered and accessible to all in some ways. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and honestly, I think, you know, the more that we can create conditions uh, for the free circulation of talent, I mean, maybe I'm an optimist and an idealist, not just Indian talent, but let other people come and work here with us. Uh, of all sorts, regardless of their national origin. Wouldn't that be lovely? And we've had that in the past. Why not go back to that? Yeah. Okay, I think we need to wind up on that very wonderful note, you know, as a, as a universalist, which is that the days of trying to build walls and prevent talent from flowing from one nation or one territory to another are long, long, long over. Thanks so much, Tharun. Thank you Thank all you for those wonderful Thank questions. Thank you very much.